Hello. Welcome to the discussion with the title Include Her, Inclusion of Women in Conflict and Post-Conflict Resolution. And I'd like to start this panel discussion actually with a quote from the Latvian Public Media News Story, April 20th of this year, which I think somehow encapsulates everything that we are really talking about today. On Wednesday, April 20th, by the Russian Embassy in Riga, about 200 women gathered in protest against sexual abuse and war crimes in Ukraine. The participants showed up partly dressed in fake blood-stained underwear, bags on their faces, and arms tied on their back. Similar protests have taken place in Vilnius and Tallinn. I think this has been one of the most powerful protests in Riga since the start of the war. But then the question is, how much of a difference did it make? And in that way, it's emblematic of the critical issues at the heart of this discussion today. Women suffer from war, women take action, but are women heard? How great is their influence in affecting what is happening to them? To discuss these issues, we have a really excellent panel, I think, today, uh, made up of three speakers. The first is Olena Suslova. She is the Gender Activity Coordinator of the Parliamentary Development Project, which is coordinated by The Ohio State University. Yeah, that's, well, that was in your biography, that. <laughs> but, but in any case, uh, but in, in line with that, I understand you were involved in consulting the Verkhovna uh, Rada about gender equality and gender issues in legislation. And you're also the founder of the, and chairman of the board of the Women's Information Consultative Center in Ukraine and have been uh, working for women's rights and human rights for the, over 20 years. Uh, Anka Feldhusen, who is joining us on Zoom, I hope she will be on the monitor now, uh, is Germany's ambassador to Ukraine since 2019. But this is actually her third posting to the country. She worked as an embassy desk officer in the 90s and was deputy head of mission from 2009 to 2015. And in addition to that, she speaks Ukrainian. So I think that I think probably few people from outside Ukraine have the kind of insight into the country that she does. And Evika Silina is parliamentary secretary of the prime minister of Latvia. Before that, she spent eight years at the Ministry of Interior as legal advisor to the minister and as parliamentary secretary, where, she, when the secure, where women's security was one of her priorities. And my name is Paul Srauceps. I'm a journalist here in Riga. And I guess I'm here to show that men should also listen sometimes. <laughs> so uh, the, um, I'll start this discussion by asking each of you to share your reflections and personal experience, because I think this should be a very practical discussion, not bound up in theory very much, but about your own personal experiences, about the role of women in conflict, uh, obviously particularly the war in Ukraine, and post-conflict resolution. So maybe, Elena, since this directly ties in, was considered with your home country, please tell us about that. Labvakar, un jels paldies, par paldizibu. We are very thankful to Latvia, and I would like to start from these words of thank to all of you. We know about your position, we know about your support, we know about uh, Ukrainian women whom you meet here in your small by size and big by heart country. And also I would like to tell very personal thanking to my colleague Iliuta Lasse, who was the first who called, wrote to us when invasion started. She is with us and today as well. Thank you, Ilute. Talking about personal experience, yes, it is a new experience. New experience to know what does it mean when you hear air raid sirens. New experience when you have to know what does it mean if some smoke somewhere. Maybe it is a, a bombing or missiles of enemy, or maybe it is a ARTA, air defense. ARTA, so we call Ukrainian air, uh, air defense. It is the experience uh, how to be in the shelter or how to be without shelter. Talking about women in this situation, you know, women, as usually in life, they play different roles. All roles what they could be. Women are caregivers. Women are decision makers, women are defenders, women are volunteers. But Ukrainian women now have more roles. They are kidnapped, they are killed, 
they raped, they captured, and everything makes us um, vulnerable and strong at the same time. Uh, I tell that actually in Ukraine now we have three strong feelings at the same time. It is a deep sorrow for fallen. It is a rage and enemy. It is a, it is a proud and Ukraine. Uh, this experience of uh, four months made us different. I do not know if it's visible for you, but for us in Ukraine it is very visible. We now could make decisions that we never could make before. About some of them we could tell this evening. We at the same time, you know, before we like to plan, we are dreamers. Now we do not plan in long term, because any kind of plan could be broken. Maybe I will finish, because I could tell about our new experience or too long, or just to stop at this point. Well, I, I hope to hear more from you. <laughs> Exactly, but more specific. You know, because uh, every single day, every single minute, we receive bad news from Ukraine. Yesterday, Odessa, city at the Black Sea, small city, living building, a resort, 20 people died. It is experience when you see in the relatively uh, safe place like Lviv, for example, no war. At the same time, you see the concentration of people in black. And you understand it is not because they like black color. It is because maybe they came to the funeral ritual of people who returned back not themselves. Thank you, Elena. We'll talk more about the particular impact of the war on women in a bit, but now I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador, uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Ambassador Feldhusen to talk about her view about what's happening in Ukraine, and particularly through the prism of women, the way the war is affecting women, and how women are reacting to the war, and trying to ameliorate, to the extent that it's possible, what's happening in Ukraine today. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for having me. Um, as you pointed out, this is not my first time in Ukraine, and um, indeed, let me perhaps just share one thing uh, that Olena also mentioned. When I was in Ukraine in 2014 with my then 12-year-old uh, son, uh, we found a piece of paper yeah, in our staircase and it showed us the way to the nearest air shelter. And I thought that was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. In 2014, we didn't need it. Um, and now I have just come back from Kiev uh, in, and in six weeks uh, we spent a total of 79 hours uh, in the air shelter. Um, I know that many Ukrainians just ignore, many Kievans just ignore it, but 79 hours in six weeks, that was really very um, disturbing. Um, as to women in conflict, uh, let me also go back to 2014. Um, because there is the issue of gender related violence that uh, somehow was not talked that much about uh, in 2014, 2015. But I very vividly remember asking um, one of my local employees, uh, a woman whose uh, grandmother is still living in Makievka, and I asked her about fear of um, soldiers, fear of separatists. Uh, and she says, yeah, you know, they're not talking about it, but nobody goes out after five o'clock in the evening when it gets dark. Uh, we all stay at home then, uh, the women who still live there. So um, what happened in Bucha and elsewhere, and I'm afraid we will see much more of it uh, um, in the East uh, once those territories will be liberated again, which I 
as fiercely as I think the Ukrainians uh, hope and pray for and expect. Um, this has always been a weapon of choice in war, I think. Uh, um, at least uh, that's how I am. And I'm of a generation who doesn't know much about war, but since I was in Ukraine in 14, 15, that was one of the issues already, at least for us, uh, um, to, to be discussed, even though it didn't get as much uh, publicity then. So I think um, perhaps just to, to then continue at some point with the discussion, uh, one of the projects that I was particularly uh, proud of that we did as the embassy was the um, attempt to bring women from the then occupied territories uh, in Donbas uh, together with uh, women from Donbas and the government controlled territories in a safe place in um, government controlled territory um, to try and sit together and speak about their experiences. Uh, uh, they were all bloggers uh, and try to um, express how they as women feel the war. And that was compared to today, uh, it, it seemed it, as, it, if, as if it was a smaller war. It wasn't. Uh, the war actually began in 2014 and has just continued on a very low flame since then. So far from me to start with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anka. Now, uh, Erika, from your point of view, you're not in Ukraine right now, but the Latvian government is contributing a great deal to supporting Ukraine. How does the specifically, how do women's issues fit into Latvia's support? For Ukraine. Yes, you're right. Well, I have not been in Ukraine uh, since the war started, but we have been receiving many refugees, and mainly those are women and children, and uh, their needs should be met. I remember when the first uh, all those uh, children and women were coming to Latvia, we needed to make these sanitary pack packages for them because usually. Um, in a usual day of life, we don't think about such things, but uh, when so many women and children are coming, uh, you need to understand that there are their special needs. From our government point of view, um, we issued a special law um, which allows those women uh, who came from war zone, from Ukraine, and we have all been hearing those stories of soldiers raping women, that they can uh, have an um, abortion in Latvia without special documentation or bureaucracy and uh, our state pays for this. So I believe, actually, before the decision was made, we didn't know how, how smooth it will go through the government. And because usually in Latvia, it's also not a very uh, easy issue as well. But uh, in this case, it actually was voted uh, very uh, in a very good percentage everyone voted for so I believe in Latvia we really understand what's going on in Ukraine and especially uh, we understand that there are women who who can carry a children they really don't want and um, from my experience um, I believe uh, also with refugees, uh, women are the, the, those who work mostly uh, as you already told as the volunteers and I just uh, think that women are those who are carrying the burden while their men are fighting against Russian army and it is very difficult time for them. So uh, we also are thinking about psychological uh, assistance for them because it's very hard for them to be away from home but still in, um, in their, because of their health and because uh, of their children they should be leaving their country. Nevertheless, uh, I believe in their hearts, they still are fighting for Ukraine. Thank you, Abika. I, uh, you raised these issues of uh, the specific needs of women in, uh, in the conflict and if they're also as, as refugees. I want to ask, Elena, uh, there's been discussion about this and I'd like to hear your point of view. Do you think women are disproportionately affected by the war or is it just a different kind of way that they're affected? Usually I tell it is not very good thing to calculate whose um, unhappiness mm -hmm. is deeper. Yeah, women and men suffer it in different way. 
At the same time, you know, I didn't like we could tell about um, women in general, and particularly on the women in Ukraine after invasion started, only as victims, only as survivors. Uh, I'm from non-governmental organization. When the invasion start, started, our brain started to work immediately. What to do? Okay, we decided. People are in panic. We have to give information. If you will visit our website, you could see we have the chapter with the name War, Vina. And at the beginning, it was absolutely different information. And the need of information changed every single day. And we decided we will not take away our old informational uh, sources because we could not even remember what was at the beginning. Um, the world never uh, maybe lived without uh, wars. At the same time, we know two different wars. Wars of 2014 and war of 2022. It is absolutely different. It is different because we didn't feel one single minute soft impact of war. And uh, women who are in the armed forces, they are real defenders, paramedics, adjusters, intelligent uh, service officers, different, different roles. We already lost some of them. We continue to lose women and men, children, uh, elderly people, etc. And you know about it very well. I would like to tell about some women. I'm very proud I know them and I'm very proud to mention them. One of them, Marina Pugacheva, she is, she, she actually, before the invasion, she was in DP already because she is a lawyer, she is from um, Donetsk, she lived in Mariupol. Mariupol, Bucha, and all the geographical points in Ukraine, unfortunately, are very well known uh, around the world. And uh, we asked her, and she said, I stay here, and I will keep children, uh, elderly people, and people with disability. What was our reaction? Marina, what do you need? Maybe you will need um, some petroleum for generator. Is it possible to buy it? That time it was been possible. We sent immediately money. Own money, money of our friends uh, like Eluta and Ozek, whom I mentioned. And one day, she stopped to write to us. And every single morning and every single evening, I took the gadget and wrote in Messenger. At first, I wrote some phrases. Later, I just sent some symbols, emoji, and I saw it. When Marina will leave Mariupol, she will see all this story because we thought about her. Fortunately, in two weeks, they left uh, Mariupol and now uh, they are in safe and uh, she is continuing to work. Other example, Yulia Payevska, Tyra, paramedic from hospital years. She started this battalion of paramedics. She was captured in the middle of March. Fortunately, she was released in the middle of June. Two months she was in captivity. One more, Yulia Dovganova. Uh, she was military intelligence uh, service um, officer. She was adjuster. She was commander of Martyr. And she was wounded very seriously. Now, after several uh, operations, she needs rehabilitation. She needs prosthetics. And in every single Zoom, in every single meeting, I tell about it. Maybe some people who hear me could tell after this meeting, Olena, please, let give us her um, contacts. We try to help her. Actually, she lost part of legs and uh, hands. And now 
She is only one of women paramedics who suffered in such way. We know it is a long trip for many of them. So we try to work, we try to be resilient, resi uh, resilient and uh, actually we try to follow our work by jokes. And you know maybe what is our superpower? We are Ukrainian. Because even our um, elderly uh, women, when they smoke at the balcony and see drone of enemies, they take jar of cucumbers and defend country by jar of cucumbers as well. Well, I think everybody who is on Twitter now is uh, seeing all the wonderful Ukrainian memes and that keeps everybody's spirits up. I think also everybody, because obviously we're very concerned about what's happening there and seeing the way that, well, I mean, the, the expressions are endless and uh, the Snake Island has re revived one that was very popular at the beginning of the war. But certainly those are very, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful to see that, that that, that spirit is alive. Uh, Anka, I wanted to ask you about how it looks from your point of view, and specifically about, we, we hear about all the Western aid, uh, everybody's worried about, you know, howitzers and javelins and stingers and munitions. Uh, we know that international organizations and the, the EU are providing humanitarian assistance as well. How much of that is aimed at women and how effective do you think it is in, in helping both those who are suffering and the organizations that are helping other women and other, other people in, in Ukraine itself? I think um, all Ukraine's partners have been very fast in responding and perhaps faster in responding to help, um, for instance, uh, people who also fled to our country, to, to Germany or Poland, where I lived for, for a few months, uh, um, less unfortunately in delivering arms, it seems, uh, but that has also taken up, uh, fortunately. Um, no, I think we have uh, directed help very quickly, very directly here um, at women. Uh, Evika already talked about it because the, the uh, people who fled Ukraine were mainly women with children. Uh, and uh, in Germany, we are also more than 800,000. Uh, and uh, yes, their needs are specific. Uh, and uh, we have been trying to, to meet those needs. Uh, the same for people in Ukraine. Uh, um, we uh, the, there's a program of the European Union, uh, you lead with Europe, which was normally decentralization, uh, one of the, the reforms that Germany has supported the most. Um, and they redirected money um, into kits uh, uh, in order to help uh, local communities. Uh, and these kits had special uh, uh, parts also for needs for, of women and children. Uh, and that was uh, put together very quickly. And perhaps just to answer Olena, whom I'm happy to, to see even virtually the last time we met in the German embassy, um, do give me the contact data of uh, the woman who needs uh, um, prosthesis. When I was in Berlin last week, uh, one of my meetings was actually with a German company that has been in Lviv already. Yeah, it's one of the market uh, leaders in prosthesis uh, and they are very keen to help and, and perhaps we can do something together uh, for, for that woman. Speaking about women, uh, you mentioned soldiers, uh, female soldiers, you mentioned uh, activists. Uh, I mainly work with the government, uh, and I do have to say that uh, working with those women in government, I'm always impressed. Olena Stefanishina, uh, Irina Berishuk, uh, Maria Lazebna, to name just three here. Yeah, they are full of fighting spirit. Uh, they have done amazing things, uh, um, especially Olga uh, on the front of the European uh, candidate status. Uh, and I'm really, really happy to meet them um, every time. So um, there are women in, in Ukraine everywhere fighting this war. Uh, um, and, and this is very, very good. Now, uh, do you have some? Did you want to respond? Just to thank. Thank you, Anka. <laughs> I, uh, yes, so we can see that, that <laughs> we're having an effect, which is, which is wonderful to see that right here. Uh, this raises the question again, also what Anka said about women in Ukrainian government and in these, uh, in her work. Uh, in the description of this uh, panel discussion on, uh, on Lampa's homepage, there's a quote from German Foreign Minister uh, Baerbock where she points to the fact that very often in conflicts, women 
suffer, but women don't have a voice in resolving these conflicts and the discussions about how, what should be done to, ameliorate, to help people and so forth. And uh, if I can quote her, she says, a society, uh, a society in which half the population does not have an equal say in decision making will never reach its full potential. Do you have the feeling that in this conflict that is still the case, or are women being represented in the highest levels in, on the decisions that affect the lives of themselves and of other women? And I'll, maybe, I'll, Eric, I'll start with you this time because you're, you, know, you are in the Prime Minister's office and uh, Prime Minister Karinch is at the, all these high-level discussions. How, do, how does it look like from the point of view of the Latvian government? <clears throat> He's in uh, high-level discussions, and I'm in discussions with the Ukrainian refugees. <laughs> That's how it probably works, uh, because uh, this is his position, and uh, I'm the one who helps um, in other issues. But um, I probably have not such a big experience with Ukrainian war, but um, I have an experience, uh, I was going through COVID crisis, if we talk uh, about women uh, policy makers, and there was a research by two uh, Liverpool University professors who found out that in, during COVID crisis, um, decisions made by leaders uh, who are women, uh, those countries suffered less uh, deaths and uh, there was more, less uh, COVID cases. What does it mean? Uh, it doesn't mean maybe that women are smarter or something like this, but uh, they were analyzing and they found out that men usually are more, their decision making are more business oriented and oriented towards economics. Uh, however, women usually uh, think more individuals uh, in a personal level and they care more about individuals. It, it means that in this policy making, we need equally men and women to think about all those issues, but uh, they're in such a crisis moments, such as COVID, uh, such as Ukrainian war, women should be presented in the policy making, in decision making, in leadership. I'm not sure when there was those negotiations before the war 2000. 22 started, but I believe if there were more women present during those negotiations when leaders were talking about how to manage this crisis because we, we knew that this is coming, I believe maybe there could be some slightly changes. Sure, we don't know what's going on in Putin's head and he's a war criminal, uh, but I believe that women who are policy makers can give a very different substance to the decisions that should be made um, in a sense for making more peace, to resolve issues more peacefully. Thank you, Avika. Olena, what's your view? Is, is, in this crisis, are women sufficiently represented at the decision-making level? I am not agree with the position that women's voices are not presented in Ukraine. Much more, I would like to tell any kind of conflict, the war is conflict as well. It is, a, it is ambivalent. It, has, it is destroyer and it is creator. Creator opens the window. And uh, I would like to tell that during eight years of war in Ukraine, we had su such changes in uh, gender policy, in all these things. By the way, related also to the security and defense sector. Mm -hmm. uh, some of uh, feminists said us, oh, you work with the security and defense sector. It means you are working for militarization. And it is a high level discussion about it. We tell it is not about militarization. It is about sensitization of the security and defense sector. And uh, increased number of women did not militarize these women. It brought absolutely different feeling. And uh, increased the number of women in the parliament. Uh, Anka mentioned um, uh, some uh, women from uh, the government. I would like to mention as well Irina Venediktova, who is a general prosecutor, who is responsible for conflict-related sexual violence cases. It is an awful phenomena. It is awful situation, and she is working on this issue. Also, I would like to mention women at the self-governance uh, at local position. They were kidnapped, they were killed, they continue to work, they continue to lead their communities. And um, yes, 
It is not 50-50. Yes, the lack of women in negotiations. But I'm so sorry. What is the percentage of women around the world in negotiations? It's not only Ukrainian phenomena. And if we see the perspective, and we, if we see the progress, we see the progress does exist. And therefore, uh, I think it is really important. By the way, uh, my next um, stage at this travel will be uh, Lugano, where uh, the next uh, week um, uh, will be the big conference, Recovery Ukraine. And it is not just to see nice resort in the Switzerland. It is because we try to include gender component in all the recovery uh, program. And this morning we had Zoom about it. And uh, my first background is civil engineer, therefore I do not know what about individual or more global, uh, maybe different, but in general, yes, I agree. And I said, uh, rec recovery of Ukraine, reconstruction of Ukraine, it doesn't mean we have to rebuild old infrastructure, old buildings. We have to rebuild, first of all, our vision, and we have built it at the uh, absolutely different uh, base. And this base is uh, equal rights, equal opportunities, equal access for women and men, girls and boys, and it is our result. It is about our voices, actually. Okay. Anka, how does it look? I mean, you've seen Ukraine develop since the 90s. Do you see this increasing role and voice of women in, in Ukraine over this time? And, and has the war, from your point of view, accelerated that? Absolutely, Paul. Um, I was in Ukraine in 2012 when the first women caucus of the then very, very few female MPs uh, being elected in the elections of 2012 met. We were, I think, five at dinner, um, cross-faction. Um, uh, since then, um, the representation of women in Ukrainian parliament has really, really grown, and they are very well organized. Uh, I have been to so many events uh, uh, organized by these uh, um, female MPs. Uh, there's the yearly uh, Ukrainian Women's Congress. Uh, um, all these things have really um, made women's uh, voices uh, um, heard much, much more since, uh, since especially 2012, 2014. Um, and uh, um, yes, overall, I know that that is a quote from my foreign minister, and I agree with her. But at the same time, we have already since 2014 tried to include women more in conflict resolution. I mentioned this one project of female bloggers meeting from both sides of the contact line, but we have always tried on the um, decentral on the local uh, communities level since we, we have really championed the decentralization reform to bring women there into the decision making, especially then in the East, in the um, local communities that uh, then received uh, and, and welcomed all the refugees from, from Donbass, uh, from the occupied territories. So um, yes, we have already put a focus on it, but I totally agree with Elena. We have, uh, we have to make progress everywhere still. Unfortunately, my ministry is always at the, at the end of all of the German ministries in terms of uh, um, uh, women in leadership positions. Uh, so Ukraine is absolutely not on its own. Now we all have to make progress and perhaps just to make you laugh, um, we have this G7 uh, reform support group in Ukraine and by pure coincidence uh, for the last uh, three years, we have been exactly four and four since the G7 are eight together with the EU, we are four men and four women. And whenever we meet with somebody or whenever we make a photo for, for social media, there are always four women, four men. And, this is a small little thing, but it has really had an impact because people see us as a completely balanced group. And I think it has also been good for our internal discussions. So they are much more productive, I think. Thank you, Anka. I, I wanted to continue a little bit about women in the military because I think that as someone who follows the Ukrainian Twitter sphere very intensely, I keep seeing things on Twitter about women soldiers, women joining the military and so forth. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that because it's so striking in fact that, that that's not only that it's happening but also that it's something that Ukraine obviously uh, is proud of and tries to communicate. Uh, what's, the back, what's the background for this and how, and how has that, has it been accepted in society? I mean, is it, are we just seeing sort of the positive part of that on Twitter? Is there some pushback in Ukraine about this? Uh, in 2015, uh, 
after the dignity revolution, the war started already, uh, Ukraine started uh, reform of national police. And uh, many people were invited to train new police. I was one of them, and uh, I actually uh, prepared the course on um, uh, non-discrimination and gender equality. And uh, we did prepare, by the way, um, in three days will be uh, the anniversary of uh, new Ukrainian police. And we prepare at the beginning in Kyiv 2,000 new police people. In each group was women and men, and was about 25-30% of women. In each group, at least one woman said, I had a dream to be military officer or border uh, guard police office, uh, officer or police officer. I never could imagine I could. And I understood when I said about defenders, it is a human feeling. It's not men on women. And they would like to be. Therefore, many of them the same when our efforts about inclusion of women at positions that never before was been done for them, they started. It was never was so easy, even territorial defense uh, forces what I mentioned. And I remember a case uh, before the uh, invasion, um, one of my colleague, m uh, male, he um, called me and said, Olena, we have two women in our territorial defense unit. We are going to the camp now for training. And our chiefs don't like to all allow uh, women to go because they said, no conditions for women. Could you help? I said, yes, I try. <laughs> and we did. Um, chain network, etc., of gender advisors, of uh, good people, of insistent people, they came. They wrote me later, think about it. I'm very happy they did it. They are really very brave. We have all the cases when uh, women consider it like uh, something, not somebody, but something uh, extraordinary. You know, when I started to work with the security and defense sector, I'm 64. Uh, then it was uh, 58 maybe. And I understood. I'm a woman. I have, I'm old woman. And I have no military experience. How I could be accepted? I knew about it, and I said about it. And I said, I will not teach you how you have to use uh, this, this or that weapon. However, I will teach you how, how to use this uh, weapon to be human, to, to, to keep balance, and to be happy before, during, and after. And uh, it works. It really works, and I think uh, it was not inspirational. It was not artificial for us, and therefore it works. And much more, motivation is very high. Motivation to defend children, land, family, house, flowers, animals, everything. I would like to ask, all people from, from Latvia to be very careful, to think how to defend yourself. I know you think you are members of NATO. At the same time, the enemy and the threat of this enemy is too high. Be careful, be prepared, and resilience is very important. Thank you, Elena. Evika, I think that you probably had some thoughts listening to what Elena was saying about women in uh, the Ministry of Interior and the Armed Forces. You have experience in the Ministry yes, of actually, Interior. I was thinking about Ministry of Interior, and um, for you just to know, maybe it's a, it's a fact. Newcomers, as a new cadets to police, as a police officers, are mostly women in Latvia. It's actually for us a little bit a trigger <laughs> because sometimes we need a little bit more balance. <laughs> but uh, sure, uh, there are women working as a, uh, border guards, there are women working in a fire department service. It was the last di service uh, where women were not so much represented, but even now there are women as, as well. 
but um, you were saying uh, it is very important for us to learn how we can defend ourselves. And uh, we had a women discussion as a politics, women who are po in politics already, and we all were actually talking about that we would like to learn how to defend ourselves. Maybe we don't have a time to go, I don't know in English the name, Zemesard, at least it's free. Uh, Home guard. Yeah, yeah. free, free, uh, free guards, but um, we would like to learn how to defend ourselves as women. Because sure, we probably will not be able to carry so heavy uh, bags and weapons in our, on our backs, but we probably could learn some um, things uh, which would be useful in a case there something happens. We, we actually can shoot as well, we can defend, and we can run. But uh, it is very important in, in times as such to really be educated about self-defense and as well how I could defend my children as well and my family. So you, li you, li you really um, triggered up a uh, very important point for us as a woman in Latvia as well. Thank you. Now, actually, I have, want to get back to Elena about a question that I've, a number of people, when they heard that I was running this panel, they, uh, from here, from Latvia, they called me and said, you have to ask this question, which I had actually, I have to say, I thought of it myself before that, but I, it's obviously very important, and this is something that, you mentioned that Ukraine took a lot of decisions during the war that perhaps it wouldn't have before. I'm not sure if this is one of them, but it was very noticed in Latvia that Ukraine has ratified the Istanbul Convention against, about, uh, against the violence against women, which, as you may know, in Latvia is a political hot potato that is being blocked in Parliament right now. And maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how Ukraine came to this decision and why it was important for Ukraine to do that. <clears throat> Um, ratification of the Istanbul Convention, it, it is very natural step for us. It is very important symbolic step to break one more bridge between our colonial past and with Russia. Because all anti-convention efforts they are not from Ukraine, and I'm sure they are not from Latvia. They were inspired from outside. Mm. I continue to research this issue more than 10 years. I have figures, I have data, I have facts, and I have some uh, conclusions about it. And I know even, I, I elaborated even some indicators of early warning. Because we saw how it started. It started before the um, Istanbul Convention was being developed by the Council of Europe. And now I tell about three markers, three indicators. First of all, so-called anti-gender groups. Uh, it is a, a lot of different researches. They were started, supported, inspired, and continue to be supported from Russia and from some right-wing groups from the U.S. Uh, second one. Second one, conditions from non-governmental organizations. You could ask me, Olena, where non-governmental organizations and where women? Not only women organizations could exist. At the same time, women who are underrepresented till now in politics, they try to be active in other areas. And non-governmental organizations are very good for us to be active. Therefore, if you know, if you remember, in Russia it started from foreign agents and from other uh, legislative limitations for non-governmental organizations. And some researchers tell that the lack of active women's movement in Russia was one of factors why it fought to the dictatorship. I agree with it, because I am 26 years in the uh, women's movement in Ukraine, I'm sure. And third marker is anti-abortion legislation. Uh, short figures. After renovation of independence of Ukraine, the first draft law, anti-abortion draft law, 
uh, came to the parliament in 2005, immediately after the Orange Revolution. Then was long, long interruption, and again it came together with President Yanukovych. And it was two, sometimes three, anti-abortion draft laws in the parliament. Therefore, returning to the Istanbul Convention, it became absolutely naturally in, in Ukraine, despite before was a lot of inspiration. Why? Because many pro-Russian groups closed, prohibited, or left to their owners in Russia. And other thing, because people in Ukraine considered it less, like natural step. Mm -hmm. And I uh, like to analyze um, different uh, things like this. And when I did read about new news about ratification of convention in Ukrainian media, I look at comments and I paid attention. Most comments was from men and it was very positive. And I remember it was at uh, one of um, uh, mainstream TV channels, uh, one uh, well-known uh, political analyst were asked about the Istanbul Convention. And he said, it is normal step. We had to do it much more early. Come on, the next question. And I think it is really because because the motivation to survive also showed people we have to be separate from things that never was originally from our history and from other our uh, works. I don't wish you to have motivation like we do. However, I wish you to have open discussion about it. Maybe to show to people who, who missed, who confused, who didn't know. Because many people whom I talked about it, they were surprised and they said, you think this party or this group are patriotic? At the same time, you see, it is the same rhetoric as from Russia. And uh, mm -hmm. Great. Anka, maybe you have something to add what, to what Elena said as somebody who's been observing Ukrainian politics in terms of specifically this issue about the Istanbul Convention. Yeah, it, I, it was very interesting uh, for me to listen to Elena on this. Uh, um, I'm sure she has done lots of stu uh, studies on, on this uh, um, issue. My personal feeling in these two and a half years or three years almost now in Ukraine where I have been really trying to lobby the ratification of the Istanbul Convention with all the heads of the churches uh, um, and, and in other uh, um, discussion groups. Uh, um, I had the feeling that uh, um, the fear of the um, MPs in the Vehovna Rada, uh, um, that uh, their voters uh, might not like it, especially those uh, um, directly uh, elected, uh, um, because the churches were so much against it, and, and all of the churches, uh, um, really, with, with the, I mean, I don't even think the German Lutheran Church in Ukraine was in favor uh, of the Istanbul Convention. Um, I think that, for me, that was one of the main um, problems with the ratification. And I know that we mentioned it often also in our in the discussions with, uh, with the president, for instance, uh, my minister did in January, and um, the, the good thing was that uh, Zelensky himself uh, and his wife were real champions uh, of the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. Yeah. But he knew that he needed to the voice the votes in Parliament. What changed, I think, and yes, it's the, it's the war main, mainly, but it's also the fact that the war made people even more um, uh, aware that their future really is in Europe uh, and they wanted EU candidate status uh, and they wanted, as Olena said, be different uh, from the aggressor yeah, and ratifying this convention was one way to show that they're different. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this, uh, it, it was all of a sudden um, less fear of the, of the churches and the influence and more um, certainty that, no, we want to go uh, towards uh, the EU uh, and we are also going to, uh, for that, for instance, ratify the Istanbul Convention. Eviko, will the Ukrainian example inspire Latvia to follow in its footsteps? 
as you may know, we have signed the convention, but we have not ratified it in our parliament. And fortunately, we still don't have enough votes for the convention ratification. But actually, your story is very similar to Latvian. And uh, before uh, the war started in Ukraine, I believe the same disinformation from Russia, the same propaganda from Russia influenced uh, many people in Latvia as well as politicians uh, not to sign the convention or not, not to ratify and to speak against the Istanbul Convention. Uh, actually, our party went to our constitutional court because there was uh, arguments that this convention is against our constitution of Latvia. So and our constitutional court said no, the convention is actually uh, absolutely okay with our constitution. So there is no any legal basis for not to ratify, for not to ratify the convention anymore. And um, what we actually have understood that there are more people uh, influenced by Russian propaganda than we actually thought they would. It showed uh, up, we saw it um, some months ago, just two months ago, we have some we have this uh, May uh, 8, 9, 10, uh, these dates for Latvia is very sensitive, actually May 9, when um, Russian, or I don't know how to say, Putin's uh, pr propaganda-oriented people actually showed themselves that they are more here in Latvia and more influenced as we actually thought it would be. So many good things have actually also happened because uh, of we have realized how dangerous Russia are to Latvia, and we have we have made good decisions uh, to be independent in our ener energy sector. We have made good decisions to be independent in our critical um, entrepreneurship basis. So there are really good decisions made. But this convention probably, I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but I don't think it will be ratified during this parliament. I hope there will be elections uh, on, uh, on the beginning of October, and I hope there will be different um, percentage uh, of um, parliamentarian members who could be more oriented, uh, pro-European oriented than it is today. Um, you are still feeling this first love of entering European Union, if I may say it like this. But Unfortunately, some of Latvian politics have already forgotten, not all, but some, forgotten this feeling when you, what you really gain when you are entering European Union. And they are playing different cards on different elections, uh, on different uh, voters. So, unfortunately, uh, the job is not uh, finished. We still have to work a little bit more. Okay. Yes, please, Elena. Yeah. Um, I forgot to tell one thing about the ratification process. Actually, five, six, or even seven years ago, before this anti-ratification process was so active, we organized, I mean, it was the initiative of our non-governmental organization, we organized in the Verkhovna Rada, in the parliament, a uh, round table. Uh, the name of this round table was what we have to do when we ratify the Istanbul Convention. It was very interesting discussion. We elaborated the whole plan with many very important specific details that was important. Most of them we did. And therefore, it was also one of plus. Uh, ratification pocket had practically everything and only some gaps what after ratification Ukraine has to do. I think it is very important. Unfortunately, I didn't find these materials before I uh, left Ukraine, but I hope I do, and I would like to, to compare and to see what we did, what we have to do, and also how it was helpful. Okay. I've been remiss as a moderator in not giving an opportunity for everybody who's listening has questions, but we have a bit more, some more time. And so please, if we could get the. Yes, first of all, thanks box. a lot for amazing discussion on so very important topic, which shouldn't be forgotten. Um, 
And I have small, at first very, very small comment on uh, women's presence in police in Latvia. I'm sorry, but this is not reason of our um, some kind of amazing uh, politics regarded uh, to the gender balance. It is about salaries. It's the same with, uh, uh, for example, academic stuff. We are also are very proud that we have 60% of academic staff women, but let's be honest, it's because of low salaries in this area. Uh, and my question uh, goes uh, uh, to um, <clears throat> uh, our guests, and I want to, to ask, uh, so the, the key of the success now in Ukraine is not only amazing spirit, you have done a, a crazy amount of homeworks starting from 2014. And it has involved also uh, a lot of work uh, done by women. And by the way, I was impressed by students in Ukraine. The first thing they wrote, girls wrote to me, was not please help us to get out or to help us somehow with money. They asked how we can get helmets, but they knew already how to fight. And for this reason, I wanted to ask, um, what would you suggest us, as those who are now in peace, how, how to empower uh, us women to, to be uh, ready as defenders? What are those specific skills and uh, knowledge? Olena, I think that's aimed at you. Maybe you have more easy question. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no answer for you, <clears throat> uh, but I know in our case, it, is, it was very hard everyday work. Um, we really have very strong and high level of maturity civil society in Ukraine. And I think it is uh, the most important thing. Even now, during the war, during the high level of atrocity, if we see something wrong from our government, from our president, we stand up immediately. It is softly, but it is very important. Um, also, we paid a lot of our time and energy to leadership training for women. Not just formal training. We try to elaborate tools what could be helpful. We work at about um, mentoring and we had uh, discussion about it. Uh, mentorship is a very popular word. At the same time, success is not such often like the word. So I'm sorry, I have no answer. But I know that um, some, during some period, we did really a lot of work that was not visible. And therefore, uh, for me, now, sometimes it's a little bit offensive to hear no women voice. They are. Maybe they have no yet such traditional way of hearing and uh, uh, voice. However, it's loud enough. And what we did, we worked very precisely about tools. Because uh, declarations are good, but when we start to work, sometimes it doesn't work. And by the way, the update of our National Action Plan 1325, after the invasion, we did it. We decided everything detailed about, detailed about problems and about activity. It could not be at the final document. However, we do prepare the instructions and we follow these official documents by all these details why we did, what we did prepare. Because we know that every, every single very small step could be very important for us. And really, it's not only about enthusiasm. It is also about support, about help. And I'm not exhausted to tell thank you, thank you, thank you. Pal dies, pal dies, pal dies. Um, we are coming to the end of the discussion. And I'll, 
okay, I'll, I'll, if, if the organizers allow me one extra minute, then it, just one short question for Ilothea. One short question for Ilothea. Just one short question. So, um, uh, it's very important to show who is criminal and who is perpetrator, who sh should keep, uh, who should be kept accountable for the crimes. And I know that your organization and you personally uh, are also involved in documenting uh, war crimes, especially sexual violence cr crimes done by uh, soldiers of Russian army. So. Um, what we face in Latvia, we see that there are problems to encourage women that have suffered from sexual violence to report. Uh, what do you do to encourage them and to actually document these crime, crimes? Work every day, sensitive work. We try to find reports, ways to keep this ways. And also, I personally, I participate in the formal investigation process as an included specialist to work to survive, to, to help to survivors and to help to investigators. And also, I call if anyone who knows person who may be suffered from conflict-related sexual violence, please let give my contacts to this person. We would like to help them. We know we could help them. We don't like to wait 20 years. We should start it now, and we did start it. Thank you, Elena. <laughs> As we can see, this is a discussion that could easily have gone on for another half hour, maybe even more, because there's so much to talk about. But it's been a fascinating, fascinating hour. Thank you to all the participants. And I also just wanted to, Elena, you said thank you. I wanted to say from the point of view of Latvia, thank you to Ukraine for what you are doing. Your battle is our battle, and thank you for what you're doing, for the, what the women of Ukraine are doing, because it's a real inspiration to all of us. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Thank you.